back in 1991 that a man named Dan Gookin wrote a book entitled DOS for Dummies. Some of you are old enough to remember that there was a time when personal computers needed to have a disk put into them. I don't remember those days myself, but they tell me that that was actually the case. Well, this book, DOS for Dummies, was trying to, in very simple language and terminology, help people to navigate this whole new world of personal computers. There were actually bookstores that refused to carry the title because they thought it was too insulting to their customers. Because after all, if you're walking around with a book called DOS for Dummies, and you kind of feel like well, you, you kind of feel like a dummy. And uh, so there were actually bookstores that said they don't want to carry that. 300 million copies of books like that with different titles and new ones coming out every year kind of tells us that they hit a successful point in the marketplace, right? It has been a huge success. The idea of this book is really simple. It's take something complex or take something that people might want to know in more simplified language and you just kind of dumb it down and you bring it into the most simple language that you possibly can. Well, there is a book in the Old Testament that has a title that's obviously very different than that and yet it gives to us the priceless, the timeless, the amazing truth of God in as simple and straightforward a way as it can possibly give it. It doesn't mean that it's always going to be simple and easy for us to understand, but it's given to us in just very straightforward, simple language. And of course, that's the book of Proverbs. So we start this morning a new series in the book of Proverbs. If you grab a pew Bible, it's page 527. If you don't, you open your Bible to about the middle, and you'll probably be in a book called Psalms, and the one right after it is called Proverbs. Here's what we want to see this morning. Right living begins with right thinking. And right thinking begins with thinking right about God, about his word, and about his way. So, as we do with every introduction, we got a lot of ground to cover, so strap on your hat, grab your pen, and here we go. Why should we study the Proverbs? Why study the Proverbs, first of all? I think, first of all, because we want to be exposed, don't we? We want to be exposed to the whole counsel of God. Uh, we want to be in the Old Testament for a period of time. We want to be in the New Testament. We, we want to hear and learn from the life of Christ and the words of Christ, uh, like we did just recently in the Sermon on the Mount. We want to also understand there are doctrines of Scripture, like the doctrine of the Holy Spirit that we just went through. But 76% of our Bible is called the Old Testament, and tucked away right in the middle of that is this wonderful book of Proverbs. We have in this book language that is called the wisdom language of of, of scripture. And so we'll talk about that in a moment, but it introduces us to a different kind of literature in the Bible as well. Secondly, we'll learn to pursue holiness and relate to each other in love. You remember when Jesus gave the simple answer, the direct answer, if you will, to the young man who asked, uh, you know, what's the, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus told him, love God and love others. And, and I think in a sense, Proverbs is going to do that for us. It's going to push us to pursue holiness and to pursue in our, in our relationship with God. And then it's going to bring those practical truths over into life and it's going to cause us to learn how to take that truth and make it happen and work in our life as we relate to each other. So one of the wonderful Proverbs says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And that's what we want to see happen as we study Proverbs. Thirdly, we will learn that our only hope for walking in wisdom is found in Christ. Because you see, in our own, uh, left to our own devices, left to our own way, we're, we're not going to pursue the wisdom of God. We're going to go our own way. That's our natural tendency. That's where our natural heart takes us. So we're going to need, again, to be asking the Holy Spirit to take his word and his truth and move us into it. And, and we want to be submitting ourselves to King Jesus, who is, after all, we're going to see as we go along the, the, the essence, the personification of wisdom is found in our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at the beginning of wisdom itself in this little bit of an intro. And, and I want to come back again and, and let's just talk for a minute about understanding wisdom literature because that's what we're going to be looking at for the months that are ahead of us. The Old Testament books that really fit into this kind of narrow category 
of, of what's called wisdom literature are the books of Job, Ecclesiastes, and then the book of Proverbs. The overwhelming theme of these three books, if you just tried to take the theme of each of these books and, and put them into a, a, just a sentence or two, I think you'd come up with something like this. God is large and we're small. God is big, he's mighty, he's powerful, we're not. God is great, we aren't. We, we'd want to see that, that God is king, he's sovereign, he's in control, we're not. That's what all these books of wisdom are saying to us in one way or another. In fact, the focus of these books, they're, they're pressing into this matter of how is it that we can, in fact, be wise? That's what the books of wisdom are doing. They're, they're asking this question. They're grappling with this matter of where can we find wisdom? How, how is it that we can be wise in our relationship with God, obviously, but also in our relationships with each other? And so when you look at the book of, of Job, and the book of Ecclesiastes, they're grappling with this matter of the perplexities of life. They're, they're really taking on the perplexities of life, aren't they? They're talk, Job is asking the, the, the question of all questions. Why is it that bad things happen to good people? Why, why is it that we have evil and suffering in our world? That's what Job is jumping into, and he's asking for the wisdom of God, and if we ever needed the wisdom of God, it would be there, wouldn't it? To try to, to, to think in terms of of why do these kinds of things happen in the lives of people? Well, then, of course, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is stepping into this matter of wisdom, and, 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 and the, the writer of Ecclesiastes, he's asking the question, what is the meaning of life? What's the purpose of life? Why am I even here? And so you see, you, you, you get in these books of wisdom, the authors grappling with the really big questions of life. And thankfully, when we get to the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, as you might know, Solomon finds the answer there, and it will be very similar to what we're going to be looking at in the weeks and months ahead. And then you come to the book of Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs is dealing with, how is it that I can live life with skill? How can I live life with skill? I mean, the fact of the matter is, we've all been around people, and sometimes we've been these people, right? Right? But we've all been around people, and sometimes we've been that person who seems to go from one calamity to another, who seems to go from one misstep and one mistake to another, who seems to just kind of step in and out of trouble all the time, who, who relationally just can't seem to quite get it together. And so the book of Proverbs is, is pressing into that matter and saying, here is how you can live life with skill. Here's how you can live life well. Proverbs calls out and tells us there's a better way. Tells us there's a way to live life successfully within the family. How is it that you can be a skillful, successful husband and father? How, how is it that you can be who God wants you to be as a, as a wife and a mother? You step into the context of, of the home. There's going to be a whole bunch in here about parenting. There's a whole bunch of stuff for teenagers, if you will, and children, right? He's going to step into the world of, of work. And whether you're in an office or whether you're in a factory or whether you're in the field or whatever it is that you're doing, the book of Proverbs is going to say, here's how you do that with integrity. Here's how you do that well. Here's how you live your life in all of these venues with skill. How is it that we relate to people and do so in a God-honoring way? Someone has gone through the book of Proverbs and they have counted up 180 different kinds of people that are listed in the book of Proverbs. 180. There's 46 different kinds of men and 23 different kinds of women. Now, we're not going to have time to do all 46 of the men, but we will take time to do all 23. No, we won't. <laughs> We probably should. I mean, is that God saying to us guys, we need more help than the ladies? I mean, there's 46 different kinds of men that are referenced. And so, you know, and children. There's a whole bunch of things that are obviously said to children. So here is a, a book that is sometimes called the handbook of successful living. So that's what we get to study for the weeks and months ahead. Let's take a closer look at Proverbs itself, the book itself. And the name and the title of the book, obviously, is given to us right away. Let's start off by asking the question, who wrote this book? 
Who, who's the one, the human author that is behind this? And chapter one, verse one tells us, doesn't it? The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. So Solomon identifies himself. He's the main human author, the main compiler of these Proverbs. We know later on that there's a man named Agur and a man named Lemuel that add to this towards the end of the book. How did Solomon, though, get to the point where he could literally write a book like this? How is it that Solomon became the wisest man in the world? Well, in 1 Kings chapter 3, and in verse 5, it, it tells us that God came to Solomon at the very beginning of his reign. Did I just say Samuel? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought I said Samuel. All right. So right at the beginning of his reign, he said uh, to Solomon, Solomon, I'll give you anything you want. Now, that's a pretty remarkable invitation, isn't it? I mean, think about that for a minute. God appears to Solomon in a dream and says, Solomon, ask of me what you want. Now, think about that. What would be some things that if you and I had an opportunity like that, the God of heaven coming to us and saying, whatever is the desire of your heart, I'll give it to you. Pretty sure there's a lot of guys that would say, I want the girl of my dreams. There's probably a lot of ladies that would say, I want the guy of my dreams. There's probably a lot of people who would be given that opportunity that would say, show me the money. I want the money. Show me how to get on the path of success to make as much money as I can possibly make because I want everything that this world affords me in that way. There'd be a lot of people probably that would say, I want to be the goat. I want to be the greatest of all time at whatever, right? I want to be the greatest musician ever. I want to be the greatest performer. I want to be the greatest businessman or businesswoman. I, I want to be the greatest athlete. I mean, just fill in the blank. But you know what Solomon asked for? Amazingly. And it had to be a work of God's grace in his life because he's a relatively young man. And God appears to him and says, Solomon, ask me for anything that you want. And Solomon says, God, I, I'm, I'm the king of over all of these people. I, I don't know how to do this job. And so I want you to give me your wisdom. And that is exactly what God did. God gave him an exceeding measure of wisdom. And the chapter, 1 Kings 3, goes on and, and into chapter 4 to talk about with that wisdom, then God blessed Solomon with all of the other things that people naturally think of when they get asked that question. Now, he, here's the sad part. Here's the sad part. Because as you, as you look and you fast forward through the life of Solomon, there came a point where he stopped listening to the words of his own wisdom. And he began to pursue the wealth of the world. And he began to open his life to multiple wives. And pride began to creep in and fill his heart. And Solomon is a wonderful reminder to us that yesterday's success in our walk with God is no certainty, it's no guarantor for success in the future. Here's the wisest man, apart from Jesus Christ probably, who ever lived. And he failed to listen to the words of his own counsel. And he ends up living his life in many regards as a fool. When was it written? Well, there's, there's a lot of history in, in, in verse 1 when he says the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. Israel, to this point, had two kings. God gave them Saul, and then God gave them David. And Solomon is the son of David. So that... Out of all of the kings, uh, out of all of the sons that David had, God chose Solomon to be the one who would take the throne after David. And so David left to Solomon a kingdom and a nation really at the pinnacle in many respects. And so here is this young man, and he comes to power, and, and God has chosen him to be the next king. And this is a time of, of, of great prosperity, of growth and glory for the nation of Israel. Tradition tells us that Solomon, as a young man, wrote the book, The Song of Solomon. As a middle-aged man, he wrote the book of Proverbs. And then as an older man, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And you kind of see that progression 
as you go through uh, his life story. So what is a proverb? Let's think together. What are we even talking about when we talk about Proverbs? Well, the word itself in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word for proverb is mashal, which simply means to be like. There's a comparison that's being made. You're taking a truth and you're comparing it, you're contrasting it with something else. In the English word, our word proverb comes from the Latin word proverba, pro, before, verba, word. So before words. So it, it, what we're really saying in a proverb is that, that we're in, in place of words. Instead of many words, we have just a few words, don't we? We oftentimes have just two lines. Instead of a lengthy discourse, we have a very short statement, often a word picture, as we're going to see in just a moment. Proverbs, somebody said, is a short sentence founded on long experience. So it's really wisdom being put forward in that way. Second thing I want you to see about Proverbs are the different elements of Proverbs. The elements of a proverb. Oftentimes they paint a picture, don't they? I mean, you think of Proverbs 30, verse 33. Pressing milk produces curds. Pressing the nose produces blood. Pursuing anger produces strife. So you can just picture somebody grabbing a nose, can't you? And twisting it, and you know when you do that, there's going to be blood. So the book of Proverbs, it's filled with all kinds of of statements like that that really paint pictures. So that's one of the things that Proverbs does. Secondly, the Proverbs just make declarations. They make declarations. They're, they're, they're not long in explaining things to us, right? They're, they're simply stating truth. They're stating wisdom. They're making declarations about how to live life skillfully. And then thirdly, the subject matter is incredibly varied. We're going to see uh, when we get down the road a little bit in our series, all kinds of subjects. In fact, you can just look on the screen. This isn't even all of the things in Proverbs. These are some of the subject matters that Solomon takes up in his wisdom. And, and you just pick one of those things and you say, this is how to live life skillfully in this arena. This is how to live life well in, in, in terms of, of, of this context of life. And so it's this incredibly practical book that is just filled with one amazing statement of truth from God's perspective after another on a whole host of subjects. The last thing that we need to see, and this is something that we have to remember as we work through Proverbs, is we're talking about Proverbs. We're not talking about promises. One of the things that as we handle the Word of God, we have to be mindful of the kind of Scripture that we're dealing with in that particular context. And this book, Proverbs is not a book of promises. If it was a book of promises, perhaps we would have the name promises, right? But it's a book of Proverbs. And so as we just said, it, it, these, these verses are painting a picture. They're, they're offering not necessarily a, a lengthy explanation. They're making statements about how to live life well. The one that comes to mind that's been most often, I think, perhaps misunderstood and misused is Proverbs 22.6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. We can't take that verse and say, if we do A, B, C, and D, God promises to do this, 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 and this. It's a proverb. It's a statement. It's general wisdom that God gives us in all of these regards. Very quickly, just the structure of the book. The structure of the book, because what we're going to find as we go forward is chapters 1 through 9 are, are really exhortations of a father to a son. If you look at verse 8, it says, Hear, my son, your father's instructions. And, and this could just as easily be, hear my son, words from your mom. So there is some interchangeability here in terms of the timeliness of this truth, right? But this is Solomon, and you can, you can just picture as we go through, especially these opening nine chapters, that he has gathered in some context his sons, and he's sharing them the wisdom that God has given to him. When he asked, and, and, and God said, anything you want, and, and he said, I want your wisdom. Well, that's what he's passing on to his sons. This is what we get to be invited into, is the wisdom of God for how to live life skillfully. Who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want to live life skillfully in context of marriage and, and the family and in the home as we relate to each other? Who doesn't want to live with skill in the marketplace of life? And in all the various venues that God takes us 
day to day. Who doesn't want to go into that with a sense of confidence that this is the, the perspective that God has about this? I mean, it's just, it, it's a remarkable, remarkable book that, that's filled with the wisdom of God. And so here we have Solomon in these opening chapters, the first nine, they're, they're lengthier discourses. So what we get to do in the first nine chapters is we, we kind of get to handle these as we would almost any other part of scripture. We'll just take a passage and we'll work our way through that passage. But then when we get to chapter 10, everything changes. Because from chapter 10 to chapter 29, it's just these maxims, it's just these proverbs that just stand alone. There's no interconnectedness necessarily between one proverb and the next. I can remember years ago, a pastor friend of mine decided that, that he and I should be, try to memorize the book of Proverbs. And, and he thought he had cracked the code, if you will. And, and he was trying to convince me that there really is a way to connect these verses together. And, and if we really try, we can, we can memorize this just like any other part of Scripture. Well, I don't know how he did, but I know I didn't do very good because there just isn't in chapters 10 through 29 a flow of thought because they're individual statements that stand alone. So we get to chapter 30. There we have Agur. He is the author of that chapter. Chapter 31, Lemuel. King Lemuel is the author by identification. And then, of course, chapter 31 uh, ends with the woman of excellence. Let's close out with this. The theme of the book. So we come to these opening verses of this first chapter. And I, want, I, I really just want to read again verses 2 through 6. And, and you listen to this expression on the part of Solomon. To know wisdom and instruction. To understand words of insight. To receive instruction in wise dealing. In righteousness, justice, and equity to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance, to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. You look at that, and, and there is this invitation to every one of us who senses that we need wisdom, and hopefully that's everybody in this room, and here is practical wisdom. Here is moral wisdom. Here, here is his guidance in terms of the truth that God has shared with us. And it all begins at verse 7. All right? Now, if we were to close our Bible right at this point, and I said to you, here's the assignment right now. Here it is. Blank is the beginning of knowledge. All right? So, without knowing already what we know, you put that before people and say, what would you put in that blank that would speak to the reality that this, in fact, is the beginning of knowledge? Well, we know there would be a certain element of people who would say, well, you better be pretty sharp. You better have a, you know, you better have a sharp mind and you better have a pretty good IQ because if you're talking about this kind of wisdom and this kind of knowledge, that you, that's going to be essential. And somebody else is going to come along and say, well, what you're going to need is you're going to need education at the elite level. You know, we, we, just what we've seen in the news in the last couple of weeks, right? Parents who so desperately want their child to be in a certain university. Why? Because they think that's the pathway of success. They, they think getting into that school and, and, and getting into that circle is for sure the path that's going to make their future brighter. Somebody else, of course, is going to come along and say, experience, right? Street smarts, just give me, give me the old street smarts of life. And then the Bible says to us, it's the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We see that in Proverbs 1.7. Here's the interesting thing. Listen to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. This is the very last verse of Ecclesiastes. To the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And then you go over to the other book of wisdom, and you go to Proverbs 28, 28, and we, to, to Job 28, 28, and he said to man, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. So Job 28, 28 says, it's the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom. 
Proverbs says it's the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of knowledge. Ecclesiastes says it's the fear of the Lord. That's the whole duty of man. So what do we want to know? We want to know what is the fear of the Lord. This is the controlling principle of life, Solomon says. The wisest man in the world has just unlocked the door for us. And he says, the controlling principle of your life needs to be the fear of the Lord because that's the beginning of knowledge. So I don't know about you, but I want to know what is the fear of the Lord. If that's the pathway to knowledge, then I need to know what that is. And I'm going to say to you this. When he says the fear of the Lord, I think principally and primarily he's talking about an attitude of heart. And I think he's talking about an attitude of heart primarily towards God. And he's talking about, I think we could say three things. He's talking about a heart of humility. Because we know that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So God's always looking for a humble heart. You can't walk in wisdom and have a proud heart. You have to have a humble heart. I think there is this utter sense of dependency. There's this utter sense of dependency. Dependency says to God, I cannot do this without you. I, I can't do any of this without you. I need you at every point. And then I think, as you see this expression all through Scripture, there is an element of worship that's involved. Because every time somebody has an encounter, for instance, with a, with a holy angel or with the angel of the Lord or even with the Lord Jesus Christ, as glimpses of his glory were, were given, it was always met with the spirit and a response of fear. Not, not in a, as you understand that, in a, in a sense of reverence, right? And so here we have this given to us. Proverbs 23, 17 says that we are to continuously be in a frame of mind where we are fearing the Lord. So it's, it's not here, it's not a Sunday morning exercise, it's something that we go with every day, everywhere. It's continuous. Proverbs 8, 13 says, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. To, to fear the Lord is to run away from sin. Proverbs 15, 16 says, when we do those things, the rewards are better than all the riches of this world. So, it is a spirit of humility. It is an attitude of dependency. It is a heart of worship. It's right thinking, ultimately, about God. He's big. I'm small. He's great. I'm not. He's in control not me. Right living begins with right thinking, and right thinking begins with thinking right about God, about his word, and about his ways. Now, sadly, there's another side to this equation, isn't there? There are those who do not fear the Lord, and Proverbs, and all of the wisdom literature, including the Psalms, call this person a fool. It's the fool who has said in their heart, David said, that there is no God. So when there is no fear of God, it is to, in fact, despise wisdom. Paul said that very thing in Romans 3.18. There is no fear of God in their heart. Wow, is that a description of our day and of our time, right? For most people, there is no fear of God. There's no sense of walking in humility before God. There's no sense of dependency on God. I've got this. I can do this. I can handle this. There's no bowing the knee in worship except to self and to my own desires and my own plans. Almost always there's the wrong picture of Jesus. They've got, they've got a Jesus in their life perhaps, but it's, it's a Jesus that isn't king and he isn't sovereign and he isn't authoritative. It's a Jesus that they can manipulate and control and do whatever it is that they desire. It's the thief on the cross, remember? The one who said to Jesus, you know, if you really are the Son of God, why don't you save us and yourself? And remember what the other thief responded with? Have you no fear of God? Have you no fear of God? 
My friends, we get to go on a journey and it's an invitation to right living and right living always begins with right thinking. You can't live right if you're not thinking right. And if you're not thinking right about God, you're not going to be thinking right about anything else in your world because it is the wisdom of God that we need and we call for. What do we take away? Let's do this. Here is the wisdom of God available to us, right? Let's, let's pursue it in these months that are ahead of us, in these weeks that are ahead of us. Let's pursue the wisdom of God like never before. Now, here's the neat thing. This is March 31st. Tomorrow is April 1. And I would just encourage you every day of the month to just take that day. Tomorrow's April 1. Read Proverbs 1. Just follow that through all the way. And, and read together as the body of Christ every day the proverb for that day. It's a wonderful discipline that you may never turn from because you will enjoy it and, and gain so much from it. Secondly, wisdom always directs us to Christ. Let's ask him to show us the way. You know, in the song Amazing Grace, that second verse says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." Right? And grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. So here's the invitation. Before we come to the elements of communion this morning, the invitation to every one of us is to invite the wisdom of God into our life. And the wisdom of God is nothing less than the Lord Jesus Christ lived out in our life. And we can have this wonderful relationship with Christ based not on works and performance and human effort, but based on this amazing grace. Because what Jesus did, he did for each one of us on the cross. And he simply invites us to believe that what he did was all that needed to be done. And he gives to us the forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life. And that's what we get to worship and celebrate here in just a moment. Let's pray. Father God, Thank you for this amazing book, the Word of God, and in particular, Father, this book of Proverbs that literally gives to us the mind of Christ and shows us how it is that we can live life well and how we can live life with skill, how we can live life with understanding. And Father, I pray that in this room there will be seekers of wisdom, and I pray that in this room there will be people who will say, Father, help me to align my life with the wisdom of your word in every area. Help me to be the husband you've called me to be. Help me to be the wife you've called me to be. Help me to be the dad and the mom. Help me to be the, the, the child, the parent, Lord, the worker, the co-worker. All, all of these things you, you want to touch our life with in very practical ways through your word. So do that, Father. Do that for the glory of your name and the building up of this body, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.